America's Cannabis Conversation. Heard every Saturday at 4.20 p.m. online at americascannabisconversation.com. We're part of the W420 Radio Network, and each week we provide you with information, education, and insight into the exploding medical and recreational cannabis industry. You'll hear from industry leaders, elected officials, local experts, detractors, and more. Learn how to build your own cannabis business, how to grow the product, what's legal, and where it's legal. Tune in each week to hear updates from the National Cannabis Industry Association in Washington. Tips on investing in cannabis markets, personal success stories, and more. It's now time to join America's Cannabis Conversation. Time now for another intriguing tale on the ever-fascinating cannabis trail with W420 Radio Network's lifestyle correspondent, Rich Walkoff. W420RadioNetwork.com Hey, today we're going to do a little time traveling. Let's go back into the Wayback Machine, like 1971, the year the Pentagon Papers were published by the New York Times. The voting age dropped from 21 to 18. Starbucks opened its first coffee shop, and Richard Nixon launched his war on drugs. Had that work out? Well, today we welcome in two of the original 420 Waldos 50 years later, I guess the war on drugs didn't work out too well, guys. And uh, you guys coined a phrase that has lived beyond its years. Amazing. So thanks so much for making the time. Dave Reddick, Steve Capper, two of the original Waldos and the 420 guys. So tell me how this came about. I know you've told the story 50 million times, but once more for the America's Cannabis Conversation. We'll tell it one more time. This is actually, as you know, this is the 50th anniversary of of screening the term 420. So back in the 70s, you know, early 70s, we were, uh, you know, there wasn't much going on. You'd go to a football game on Friday night and cruise around and look for parties, right? So we're, we're sitting under the grandstand smoking a doobie going, what are we doing here? There's got to be something better than this. So, Steve, go ahead. <laughs> well, we, we first started with something called safaris. I was reading, my brother had Rolling Stone magazine, which in 1971 was total counterculture. Nobody got that magazine at all. And I was reading an article about down in the South Bay, there were some scientists that were developing the first holograms. And back then, 71, like images made, three-dimensional images made out of, of laser light, you're all, it's total science fiction. It said they were there 24 hours a day working on their stuff and they were excited and uh, so I got, well, what the hell? I used to take Cub Scout field trips. I'll go down and pound on their door <laughs> and see if they'd show me their, they had a holographic city, a whole city made out of holographic, holographic light. So I went down there, I pounded on the door and they just welcomed me and showed me everything they were doing. And we had a lot of laughs and they go, hey, I'll, I'll go back and get the Waldos and we'll all go down there. So the following week I said, you guys got to see this. We piled in the car, of course we, we got high. They went down there and we pounded on the door and hung out with these scientists. We had them crack, cracking up, laughing. And uh, uh, we go, well, that's great. You know, uh, something else to do besides go to the football game. So we decided each week we were going to do something unusual and different rather than the, the normal stuff. And Dave named the, these, these little adventures. Dave? Yeah, well, I said, hey, this is kind of like we're going on a safari. Why don't we just call them safaris? So every week we try to come up with something new to do that's, you know, we were like seekers. We wanted to do something fun, meet interesting, weird people and do weird things. And that's what our goal was. So one day we're, we hung out on a wall at, in the center of campus at Centerfell High School. Uh, that's why we call ourselves the Waldo. We hung out on a wall. And uh, one day we're, I'm sitting oh, on the wall. Let's preface that before you get there. Okay. We used to sit on this wall and, and you know, breaks between class and we'd watch all the people walk by and we'd do impressions of these people and you know we'd try to crack each other up as we watch these people going by that was you know we were totally into com comedy so we, we created hundreds of catchphrases and slogans and 420 was another one of our slogan 420 is just the tip of the iceberg of our of our waldo culture anyway so sitting on the wall a buddy of mine comes up and he goes, hey, my brother's in the U.S. Coast Guard out at Point Reyes. And for some reason, these guys, and they're growing weed. And for some reason, these Coast Guard guys think that their commanding officer is going to bust them. 
They don't want to get busted. So they decided to relinquish their growing patch. And they decided that Bill and his friends, which was us, could pick it. And the Coast Guard guy made a map of where the weed was. And uh, I showed it to Dave. Dave got excited. Oh, yeah. It was like a no-brainer. You're a you're 16-year-old kid. You have no money. Free weed. It's a no-brainer. <laughs> so what about the 420 moniker? How did that come into play? I mean, one would think it's 420 in the afternoon. Let's get together. Get, let's get high. And by the way, for those out of the Bay Area, San Rafael High School, about 20 miles north of San Francisco, in the epicenter of the counterculture movement back a half a century ago. Right. So uh, we not only were we, you know, just Waldos, we, we weren't typical stoners. We're not Spicoli, you know, at Fast Times at Ridgemont High. You know, most people think stoners, they're lethargic, they're lazy, they're forgetful. No, we were active. Uh, we're getting a, a awards for, for uh, exceeding in, in classes. We were athletes, everything. But we you weren't stupid too. stoners, no. No, absolutely not stupid stoners. Not everything you see in movies. So a couple of the guys had football practice for like, we got out of school around three o'clock. It was a flexible schedule. Some got out at 310, some got out at 315. So a couple of the Waldos, they had football practice about approximately an hour. So we decided to meet, there's a, a statue of the chemist, Louis Pasteur, who invented pasteurization. And we decided to meet at the statue of Louis Pasteur at 420 to get high and go find this weed that the guys in the Coast Guard were growing. So we would remind each other in the hallways all day long. We'd see each other and we'd, we'd, we'd nod, smile, we'd go, 420 Louis. 420 Louis. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and then, of course, we, we, we meet, we smoke, we go look for the pot. After about the third week of trying to find it, uh, we just dropped Louis and we just we, smile and we go, 420. We, we knew that we could use this little code. It, it was our secret code. Uh, and we could use it you know, in front of our teachers, our parents, Cops, nobody knew what we were talking about. You know, we re referenced 420 and we knew what we were talking about, but they didn't. So we, it was our own secret little code. And it, it passed from us to our younger brothers, the class behind them. Uh, we went away to college. We used it with people, uh, you know, from other cities when we were away at college and it spread. And then there's the, the Grateful Dead connect, one of the Grateful Dead connections with Dave. Go ahead, Dave. Oh, my brother, Patrick, um, he, he was friends with Phil Lesh for like 50 years and uh, they're good friends. And um, in 1975, the dead took a, a, a by almost a year off. And so Phil started a couple bands. One was called Sea Stones and the other one was called Too Loose to Truck. And he asked my brother, Pat, if he could manage them. And Pat said, sure. And Pat hired me to be a roadie for these bands. And uh, we were getting high backstage with, you know, I was getting high backstage with Phil Lesh and guys like David Crosby and Terry Haggerty of the Suns, who was in Too Loose to Truck. And I started spreading it around that way. And over the years, you know, they, the dead crew were using it a little bit and then it spread out. So, and then, and then there was another thing, Waldo and Mark, uh, by the way, there's five Waldos. There's Dave, there's Steve, uh, there's Mark, there's Larry, and there's Jeff. And uh, you, you can switch out one Waldo for the other in an in interview. It's kind of like the Three Stooges. You can bring that's a shemp in for a curly. That's <laughs> just, it's, kind of like, it's kind of like changing deck chairs on the Titanic. Yeah. Well, <laughs> well but you're comfortable, <laughs> unlike the Titanic. So here you guys are, half a century later, as the merry pranksters of the day and still retain that spirit of the 60s counterculture and the like. Can you tell me how cannabis played into that i mean it was a fun and uh invigorating and, and creative source of you know what you did back in the day how about as it evolved in your life well first of all pe people these days because it's just you know legal and people are buying at the store and you're, you're driving down the freeway and there's billboards for cannabis delivery delivery people forget how illegal it was and we spent our entire lives looking over our shoulder running Using our secret places and and you know trying to score weed, you know, and and we knew you could get busted. You could you could get thrown in jail for ten years for a joint back there in some states. Building pipes out of uh, watermelons, <laughs> toilet roll, toilet rolls, and everything else. It, it was we were like outlaws. We were desperados, comedic desperados. Uh, and, and an interesting part of our story is Waldo Jeff 
his father was one of the highest level narcotics officers, officers in the state of California. So there's a whole interesting aspect of the story. One of the guys who started 420, his dad was a narc. Jeff, and, Jeff uh, knew all about search and seizure laws. So he clued us into things like, you know, if you have uh, something in your glove box and it's locked, the cops can't ask you to open it without getting a warrant. And one time we were up at Lake Tahoe, Steve, me and Jeff, and uh, so Jeff and I went into the casino where it's state line. And Steve says, I'm gonna roll some doobies, come back in a little while. And we split Jeff and I, and then we started coming back. And then we see Steve with these Nevada sheriff's cars, a couple of them around the car, and they're trying to bust Steve. So, you know, there's Go a ahead. whole funny story there. That's kind of a long story. I don't know how much time we have. Well, I'd love to hear an essence of, because this really, as I say, personifies the spirit of the time where you had to be, it's a cat and mouse dodging the lawman. And today it's, you know, part of the, uh, the culture. It's so much more accepted, but the evolution is fascinating. And in a lot of ways, you guys in that time helped launch it. So uh, I'm just curious how <clears throat> Wow, for you through the decades. Well, we didn't know we were creating history at the time. All we knew is we were having fun. We were all about having fun and having adventures, you know. So as the years went by, we started noticing, you know, about, you know, 1996 or even earlier, we started noticing people were spray painting 420 on signs and rocks and carving it into benches. And uh, one day, uh, Waldo Larry Schwartz, called up Steve and says, hey, this is everywhere. We got to We got to do something about this, Steve. So to to, to uh, secure the origins of this, because it went off into so many theories. Half the country thought it was uh, a police code for being busted for marijuana or transporting marijuana or, or whatever. And, and then there were other theories. It was the time, I don't know, it's evolved over the years. The time Jerry Garcia died, not true. There's 420 chemical constituents and THC, which is the part which gets you high. So we said, we got to get the origin straight. So uh, I wrote a letter to High Times and they, uh, the chief, the editor in chief, he flew out to California and documented, we have all kinds of physical proof, physical evidence proof, and he documented this. And that was kind of the launch of the world beginning to get to know us. And then eventually Huffington Post and New York Times and LA Times and everybody started examining further. And uh, uh, we have the history. We have it on our website, 420waldos.com. And we keep we keep all the physical documents of our proof in a, uh, a de safe deposit box at, at the Wells Fargo Bank in San Francisco. And guess what the address is? It's 420 Montgomery Street. <laughs> oh, I love it. love it. That's serendipity. And Lagunitas Brewery has a Waldo special ale in your honor. Yeah, about 10 years ago, uh, Lagunitas was doing some experimentation with uh, different beers and they were doing, you know, like celebrity beers, like with Frank Zappa and family and other rock stars. And they had these psychedelic uh, uh, labels and they're creating these beers. They're like, you know, just one off beers. They contacted us and they said, we'd love to do a beer with you guys. So we said, yeah, that would be cool. So we went up there and uh, we picked out all the hops and we wanted to pick the hops, the, the dankest and smelled mostly like marijuana and tasted like marijuana. So we picked out the hops, they brewed it up and uh, they released it and the rest is history. Because We've been doing it for what, seven years or eight years no, now? No, more like nine years now. It, it, it's seasonal, they do it about, they start brewing it about a month or two before 420. And it'll be in the stores uh, very, very shortly. Last year, they didn't have it in the stores in bottles because of the pandemic. But this year, it'll be in bottles and it'll be released nationwide because they have a Heineken owns Lagunitas now. And, and they have a brewery in Chicago to cover the East Coast. And they have the brewery in Petaluma to cover the West Coast in, and all in between. So the beer should be out there. It should be on the shelves real soon. So go out and get a pack. <laughs> the, the, car, the carton that has the beers in it, I mean, it has our story on the outside. Uh, you know, so there, there's the story is woven into all their marketing. Now, it's not like the High Hops, which is a non-alcoholic beer infused with cannabis. This is a... Well, how would you describe the Waldo special ale that Lagunitas makes? It's, it's beer, 
but it's with the hops that you guys selected or, or yes, preferred? Yes. Uh, there's actually okay. a video on our website of us going around. It's pretty funny of us selecting the hops. It's tragically hip. Yeah. So, <laughs> how do you, what, hip. so you guys say that you belied that stoner, you know, you know, deadbeat image a, a half a century ago. What did you guys do with your careers? You, you five the so-called Beatles of 420. What did you guys do with careers and, and lives and, and such? Well, I started off uh, in broadcasting. I was a disc jockey up at Lake Tahoe. And then I got into television production. I worked over at KPIX for a few years. Then I went to PM Magazine. I was a satellite uh, producer and coordinator. And then I went to CNN and I was a cameraman there, uh, freelance and staff for about 20 years. And I work with, with Don Knapp, like you, you, just, you said, you know, Don, he was one of the yes. great reporters I ever worked with, a great guy. So after uh, they closed the bureau in uh, San Francisco, that was about 2001, I went over to Tech TV for about a year. And then uh, Paul Allen folded that company and I've been an independent filmmaker since. He's also a social director on a tugboat. That's right. <laughs> All right. How about the rest of your buddies? Um, I had uh, 30 years ago, I started from a, what, a, like a six foot by six foot cubicle. That's a real specialty kind of finance company. It's uh, accounts receivables, funding and specialty niches. Um, uh, I had about 30 years. Uh, right now, I'm actually the technologies that we've developed. I hope in the next six months that I can take these technologies to facilitate other people financing receivables in the cannabis space. Sweet. So let's see if I can put that together. Awesome. How are you guys going to celebrate the 50th anniversary of your 420, uh, you know, pioneering efforts? It'll be a virtual celebration followed by deli platters. <laughs> <laughs> we, we probably, you know, it, with, with the pandemic last year, we, we did some interviews and I actually hooked up with uh, Waldo Larry and we, uh, we were on the iPhone and I, we, we shared a, a virtual joint. I'd take a puff and pass it to him and he'd take it and pass it back to me. So I don't know what we're doing this year. Well, but last, whatever last, it is. last year we did a, uh, a virtual celebration with uh, Art Review Group, which is uh, kind of like the entire marijuana industry, not so much the public. And they want us back. Uh, they really want us back this year. So we agreed to do that this year. Uh, we'll be we, on with Steve D'Angelo, uh, the high king of weed, and you know, for, for medical marijuana and things like he owns, he owns the uh, harbor side over in Oakland. Right. Yeah. We, 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 appeal, we appeal to a small select group of confused people. <laughs> well, you know what's cool is that you're Zooming and you're on Zoom. So it's all how appropriate. Guys, it's been awesome catching up with you. Congratulations on this iconic half century of the 420 Waldos, you deserve all the accolades you've uh, you've gotten and great luck in the future. If you want to hear more or listen again, go to the W420radionetwork.com slash archive. Rich Walcott with the Waldos, the 420 founders, Dave Reddix and Steve Capper. Thanks, guys. It's Thanks, fun. Rich. Thanks for having us. Happy 420. <laughs> right on. We'll be right back. Everywhere you look, you see stories about cannabis and CBD. But how can you trust that you're getting accurate information? We want to introduce you to America's Cannabis Conversation. This program is designed to help you gain as much information as you can about the cannabis industry. If you're considering starting your own cannabis business, listen and find out if the cannabis business is right for you. Do you have pain, sleep problems, or other illnesses? Find out if cannabis or CBD might help you. Tune in to our Cannabis Doctor on Call feature and hear how cannabis and CBD has helped others. The serial cannabis entrepreneur can help you decide if the cannabis business is right for you. Every week, this one-hour program connects you with experts from many facets of the cannabis business to grow your knowledge and help you make better, more informed decisions. Join the conversation Saturdays at 4 p.m. and Wednesdays at 6 p.m. Eastern at AmericasCannabisConversation.com. 
Hey, cannabis fans, I don't know if you believe in the afterlife, but I think I found heaven on earth right here at Luma Farms, kind of a boutique grow in Pengrove, California, just about an hour north of San Francisco. And we're here with the director of cultivation, the amazing Enzo. You're the botanist. You're the horticultural guy. You're the <laughs> guru of weed, man. What do we got going on here? This is phenomenal. Uh, here we have organic, lee grown, uh, regenerative, sustainable practices, uh, utilizing living soil, working with cover plants and cover crops and organisms and building soil health. Yeah, now you, ultimately. You, you talk about living soil. What, what is that all about? Because there's a different, we had Patrick King, the soil king, on. Oh, he's yeah, talking about yeah. there's dirt that's dead and there's soil that's living and that's what you want and that's what you have absolutely living soil has to do with organisms and uh, the communities of organisms that are in the soil um, earthworms and other plant species mm -hmm. uh, living soil utilizes these organisms to cycle the nutrients instead of relying on synthetic uh, plant available uh, soluble fertilizer mm -hmm. these organisms in the living soil which makes living soil actually help feed the plants so now you guys are making hash hash oil rosin tell me a little bit about rosin which a lot of people may not even know about rosin is made by uh, heat and pressure being applied to bubble hash um, it is the most refined concentrate uh, made solventlessly that you can that you can create yeah and, and about the soil, how key is it? I mean, there's commercial soils, there's, you know, so-called organic soils, but what are you looking for? What are the, some of the key considerations when you create the foundation for your plants? Yeah, you wanna build soil with quality inputs. Uh, you wanna have foresight into drainage and um, moisture retention and all the different components that uh, will allow your soil to function correctly. Uh, the best soil is, is native soil is is revitalizing native soil and um, that's essentially what we're doing here so in your soil we're talking about what you put into it to, make to it. supplement it or give it added nutrients so maybe? constantly paying attention to the phase of the plant's life uh, we add organic amendments uh, organic matter in the form of different plants mm -hmm. and, and i know you told me it's not just the plant in the raised bed their their roots are going deep so it's not like a planter because that's going to inhibit the growth absolutely the, so tell me a little bit more about that well here in the petaluma gap where we are at, and pengrove uh we're on adobe and uh, i understand it to be ancient seabed so highly mineralized but also very compact so um that plays into terrar. Mm -hmm. It's one of the, the factors that you may or may not be able to have a say in mm -hmm. is the composition of, of this native soil. So how many different v varieties do you have? And are they from clones, from seed? What's the genesis? Right now we have uh, over 70 varieties. That is because we are hunting through some to find something special. Uh, most of everything here is from clone, but there was some seeds grown and clones taken from them to be tested. Okay, what's your fave and, and what's your go-to? Uh, my fave is actually one that I created a couple years ago called Lemon Limes, and uh, it's extremely potent and uh, it leaves you it leaves you wondering where you are. <laughs> <laughs> in a good way. In a now, good I gotta way. I got to ask you, some people are enamored with the THC. Yes. And uh, Bob Stefano from Villa Paradiso up in, uh, he's one of the Humboldt original high five guys. Yeah. Said to me, don't get caught up in THC. That's like telling me a Dodge Charger is a better car than a Ferrari. Yeah. So a lot of people are enamored with, oh, look, I got 30% THC. I, I love that. It's very short-sighted. Yeah, it's you're, not the full spectrum. The entourage is more important, right? Absolutely. You will not experience all that the plant has to offer if you're just going for a product with a high THC. Yeah. Um, a lot of those labs, too, are deceiving. So as a consumer, you may not be really getting what you're after, yeah. you know, and, and you're being sold kind of a kind of a an effect with a ceiling. You know, it's okay. it's it's going to kind of reach a point and you're and you're never gonna get past that well again it's not just about horsepower right and thc is the the metaphor of the for the horsepower of the of the plant but there's much more to it so you're looking to create something that gives you 
maybe the nice buzz is a certain euphoric full spectrum experience of the plant, whether it's medicinal, recreational or whatever. A lot of the focus lately has been on finding genetics that have very unique flavors, very profound uh, exotic flavors. Uh, when making hash and rosin, that's kind of the focus. Uh, people aren't really thinking about the THC percentage as much in that community mm -hmm. or demographic. They are focused on the, the enjoyment of the flavor. And with Enzo, the Director of Cultivation at Luma Farms here in Pengrove, California, I'm Rich Walkoff on the W420 Radio Network, and we'll be right back. Hey, we're returning to the scene of the farm, Luma Farms in Pengrove, California. I'm Rich Walkoff, along with Enzo, the Director of Cultivation, and Curtis Wall, the founder of Luma Farms. It's an amazing biodynamic, organic grow. And we were here a few months ago, and it was close to harvest time. So it was the peak of the colas and the flowers, and now it's approaching winter time. What's going on? You've been working your tails off to create this product fresh frozen i'm hearing about for the first time what's that all about fresh frozen weed is capturing the resin in its quote unquote live state as it was growing on the plant without the not letting it have the opportunity to dry so you're freezing the plant while it's still green while it's still got a uh, moisture in it and it's essentially still alive and you're putting it into a frozen state to capture the essences, the terpenes, the cannabinoids, just as they were during the growth stages. Yeah, and oxygen is the enemy, right? You don't want oxygen around it. You don't want light around it after you harvest. So tell me a little bit about that, Curtis, if you would. Yeah, you definitely don't want, uh, especially when you're drying uh, cannabis in, in its dry form, you definitely don't want any light in there. It can degrade the terpenes and cannabinoids and all those different things. With fresh frozen, it goes right into a big bin and it goes into the freezer and it doesn't see any light until yeah. it gets to the extractor. Now, how long do you have to keep it like that? You have about 20 minutes to, to oh, get wow. it into the freezer from harvest before degradation sets in. Um, as far as length of time in the freezer, if you have your parameters set correctly, you could live in the freezer for a couple of years. Wow, but what is your general timeline we would love to get it to the consumer as fast as possible. Uh, there's just all the hurdles of the regulations. Now, well, you're doing it as a commercial kind of a boutique grow because you have the high end. It's the cleanest. You don't use any of the chemicals. It's living soil, as you, you commonly talk about. But what about a, a, a home grow? I mean, I'm just an average Joe and I got a few plants and I want to cure. I want to dry. I want to cure and process. What are some of the tips that you could pass along as the expert growers? I would say some great tips are put it in a dark room, hang it upside down, get a low airflow around it, not direct airflow, 60% humidity, 60 degrees temperature, and about 14 days. Oh, good. I've done all those things. And we had a big storm in Northern California a few weeks ago, and my home grow, those buds were just falling over. Oh they were God. so wet. They had just soaked up all the rain with eight inches of rain. And thankfully, after two weeks with dehumidifiers and fans and everything, things have dried and we're in the next phase of, uh, you know, now I'm going to trim and, and yeah. jar them up. And then aerating in jars. What do you do in a commercial uh, enterprise like this, even though, as I say, it's kind of boutique because you're not doing massive quantities, although it's, it's a healthy number. Yeah. And then what would you do residentially or, you know, the home grow? So the home grow, I would treat every jar <clears throat> as an environment and I would allow the gases, uh, things off gassing to build up in that jar. And then every other day I would burp it for 30 to 45 minutes until you reach a consistency, a moisture consistency that you really like. Yeah. Now you guys have a specialty. You're not just growing great weed. And if we could bring in some of these beauties, you have a variety of crops. These are eight samples, right? And what are you growing? And then not just for the flowers, which are magnificent, but you have something else going on that is, uh, it takes you to a whole nother level. So I'll, I'll defer to the founder here, Curtis. Yeah, so we grow genetics that are uh, supposed to be good for making hash. Things that are uh, the customer is really going to want. They like uh, very fruity flavors, mm -hmm. um, desserts, things like that. Anything that's super unique and special that they can't find at any other place. Um, so that's pretty much what we're looking for in our genetic um, selection for our outdoor. Okay, so when you make hash, now Enzo told us a little bit about this in our first conversation, but part two, maybe you can expand upon it. Tell us why what you do is so 
much better and why you do what you do. Well, what we do is we grow cannabis in what we believe is the best way possible. And then we work with the best people in our industry and in our space to, to make the hash and the rosin. And those people take it <clears throat> from the freezer and they bring it into a cold room. It then goes into a washing machine. It could be hand stirred or it could be machine stirred depending on the infrastructure setup. They then uh, pour that solution through a set of filters catching the different size glands through all those different filters. Now you take the glands that have been caught in those filters and you put them into a freeze dryer. You effectively dry the glands, remove the moisture without letting them oxidize, without the presence of oxygen, because there's a vacuum on this freeze dryer. Um, so now you pull out your resin and it's it's in a pristine state. It has, it's white, it hasn't oxidized, it's all heads. And now you have the raw material to press rosin. Rosin is the refinement of hash. It is hash pressed through more filtration with heat and pressure. Wow, wow. So if I hear something about diamonds and honey. So diamonds are made just like in the environment and in the earth, heat and pressure. In the solventless world, uh, you would put rosin into a jar and you would seal it and you would let that jar reach room temperature. That's the heat. The pressure is the seal and you not breaking the seal and allowing those gases to build into that. So that's how we make solventless diamonds. How you make the BHO ones, that's a whole nother process that we don't really partake yeah, in. That's, yeah, solvents are harsh, sometimes dangerous chemicals, but they're used in the process in most commercial um, hash manufacturing. You guys don't do that. And you tell me why, please. Uh, we believe in healthy consumption. Uh, we grow in the, what we believe is the healthiest way to grow, to produce the best produce for human consumption and the impact on the earth. Um, when you use a thing like butane or, or, or any of those harsh volatile solvents to extract from a plant, it, it doesn't go hand in hand with the style of cultivation and the life that we like to, to live, you know, the healthy lifestyle. You know, state of California and many states have very stringent regulations. So how, how is that monitored? And are you get that good seal of approval? Do you get that organic, you know, butane-free tag on it when you create your rosin and such? No, they don't offer anything like like that. We couldn't even use the word organic on any of our packaging That's up to this day. That's unfortunate, isn't it? Yeah, it's it's bonkers. Um, I think that there's something coming along um, through the pipeline where they're going to start allowing us to use the word organic. Yeah, but think about it. Your process is more laborious and probably more costly totally. and better. The other one is cheaper and uh, more you know volume oriented. So if the consumer is left in the dark. I mean, where's the win on that? <laughs> I don't get it. Yeah, I don't know. You know, for the longest time, I was also left in the dark, you know, um, kind of being new to the space and seeing the different consistencies and colors that I've never really seen before because you're able to really filter out a lot of the, the you know, dirt, darker sort of... Uh, you know, impurities, impurities yeah, in the yeah. in the flour and in the product. So for me, going to the dispensary, I was like, oh, this is great, you know. Uh, but then it's over the past two, three years when I've only been smoking solventless strictly, um, I've really realized the, dis the, the difference going back, trying some of this, you know, sauce or diamonds or right. it hurts my throat. Right. And I'm not just saying that. No, it, it I, I bet. It's sort of like when you get black market weed where you don't know what chemicals were put in to the process of growing it, whereas... If you get it from a dispensary, you know it's authenticated in terms of that aspect of it. But the fact that they don't distinguish between what you're doing and the chemical infused or created um, hash and rosin is, is really baffling, as I say. So guys, I tried that and man, it is freaking awesome. And it's smooth, it's clean, it's a really sweet high. And I just think you guys are, are killing it. By the way, we're in a studio that will rival anything I've ever been in. I mean, this is like Hollywood comes to uh, Northern California, man. This is awesome. You've got uh, state-of-the-art, everything going on. And I don't know about many grows that have a setup like you do here at Luma Farms. So tell me about what, what, are, we, what are we all about here? Yeah, so uh, this is uh, Luma Studio, Luma Network. We're trying to, um, first and foremost, promote our brand, Luma. We're trying to you know, think long term, three to five years. Once cannabis goes national, we're able to cross state lines and, um, you know, sell to consumers everywhere. We want to make sure that, you know, 
we're already in their hearts and minds. Yeah, so you can create content as well as growing the great stuff. And then you could tell your story like you are here on the America's Cannabis Conversation. We're giving you a forum because I love your stuff and you guys are awesome. So Enzo, when you come into the studio like this and you get a chance to tell your tale, I mean, what are some of the, some of the secrets that you can reveal that we haven't <laughs> discussed about your process of harvesting, curing, processing and the like? Uh, genetic selection, uh, maintaining the nursery space, mother rooms, the, the, the great amount of effort that goes into uh, weathering the storms. Yeah. Uh, this, speaking of storms, we just had a hell of a storm recently, right. uh, which we weathered through harvest. Um, just, just the culmination of effort that goes into literally every layer, no shortcuts taken. We, we strive to do our best at every stage. Um, we really believe and care about everything that we do here. Yeah, now obviously I, I could tell, I could see it, I could taste it. But when you grow a few hundred plants versus these commercial grows, these massive commercial grows that may be growing thousands, differentiate. Tell me what's the difference between how you process, cure, and, and deliver your flowers and hash and rosin and the like versus the massive like agribusiness growth. I'd put it in one word, care. We, we take the care and the thoughtfulness and the consideration to do every step right. And we have a small enough, even though it's not, you know, it's a sizable grow that we have here. It's small enough to pay attention to everything. Mm -hmm. Things don't get overlooked. We're not spread so thin that we have to cut corners. These are the things you see when you scale up. You lose craft when you scale because it's hard to delegate craft. It's hard to delegate what one person does to a to an army of employees. Right, that's a great word, the craft. I, I refer to you guys as kind of the boutique, a well, similar vein. In Absolutely. That it, it, it's, it's like you're handcrafted, you're, you're monitoring every plant, every cola, versus these massive machine hewn uh, enterprises. We are, we are harvesting by hand, we're bucking by hand, we're doing all this process very intimately. Yeah. One question that you had asked earlier was how does someone cure on small scale versus yeah. large scale? On a small scale, I was saying, you know, in jars and burping it every 45 minutes, every other day, till you're at the right moisture. Large scale, we can't put that much weed in that many jars. It's not cost efficient or space efficient or labor efficient. Sure. And so what we have to do is we have to create an environment, a huge environment that is like a jar. And we treat mm -hmm. the huge environment like a jar. Right. Well, that's why your stuff is so awesome. That's one that part of it. <laughs> Great stuff, guys. You've only been around a few years, but I think uh, the best is yet to come. Congrats on all your successes on the America's Cannabis Conversation. We're with Enzo and Curtis Wall here at Luma Farms in Pengrove, California on the W420 Radio Network. You're listening to America's Cannabis Conversation on W420RadioNetwork.com. Are you interested in learning more about cannabis? Have you thought about starting your own cannabis business but don't know how? If so, we invite you to join the Cannabis Conversation with other people like you who are looking at the exciting opportunities in this exploding business. Listen to America's Cannabis Conversation. You'll hear from industry experts and get insights into the cannabis industry. For archived shows and for more information, log on to americascannabisconversation.com. It's time for Women in Cannabis on America's Cannabis Conversation, part of the W420 Radio Network. Didn't you get the memo? Here's Chase Roberts. Welcome back to the conversation. This is Chase Roberts, Women in Cannabis correspondent for the W420 Radio Network. It's a pleasure to introduce Penny Cook, Acting Chief Operating Officer and Advisor of Lemon Haze. Lemon Haze is a B2B cannabis events company. Penny, welcome. Thanks for being here. How are you? Thanks for having me. I'm great, Chase. Happy to be here. We're really happy to have you. Um, I always like to start at the beginning. Can you tell me a little bit about your life? Where did you grow up? Where did you go to school? Oh, sure. Sure. So I actually grew up in Philadelphia. I'm an East Coaster at heart. Love it. Uh, I went to school at Wesleyan University in Connecticut, and after I graduated, I uh, realized I could be unemployed in the city of my choice, 
<laughs> and decided to get in my car with one of my college roommates and we drove around the country for a month and ended up in Seattle. And I had never lived on the West Coast. I thought it would be a great adventure for six months or so. And yeah. I had planned yeah. to go back to the East Coast and, you know, in either Boston or DC and get a real job like everybody else. And that was over 25 years ago. And I'm still here in Seattle. Love it. That month sounds like it was probably a pretty pivotal month in your life. Yeah, it was amazing. I mean, I, I can't imagine going back and doing that now, but really seeing the whole country and having some time to really think about what was next after college uh, was was great. And then ending up in a place like where I really found, uh, I found community and I found industry and uh, learned about the whole startup culture that yes. the West Coast has. And I really, uh, you know, I became part of it and I fell in love with it. And I think that's a lot of what feeds how uh, Seattle has been in the forefront of the cannabis industry and how I got into that in the first place. I was going to ask you, did you ever imagine you would be in this industry? Not at all. <laughs> Not at all. And no one ever would, does. No one ever does. Right. I, I mean, I, I think growing up and through college, I was part of, you know, the, the generation that was fed the stigma that that marijuana was a drug and you should stay away from it. Um, and thank goodness I'm in a forward thinking place where I really got to be reeducated pretty quickly in understanding that uh, it's it is a it's, it's a great tool for wellness. Absolutely. We're going to go in into all the benefits. And I, I just want to mention really quick to our listeners that you also are the chief operating officer at Zonin. Can you tell right. us a little bit about that as well? Zonin CBD. Yep. Zonin CBD is athlete founded. So we are uh, we're part of a professional athlete network that um, produces CBD products for athletes and active adults to perform better to recover more quickly, to um, gain more mental focus and uh, really promote an overall healthy, active lifestyle, which is something that, you know, cannabinoids are amazing things. And we're really at the very beginning of learning what cannabinoids can do to help promote wellness in our bodies. And there's a lot to be said for um, cannabinoids like CBD and THC helping us relax and sleep, but there's a lot of research going on now. And a lot of people are taking this to actually uh, perform better during their day. You know, I think, uh, I think the, the NFL is actively right now trying to pursue that research. Yep. If I got that correct. Yeah. Uh, and I'm really happy about that. And I noticed you, you serve on the board of commissioners for Seattle sports. Is that directly related to your work? So I, I, I did. I'm not a commissioner at this point. Um, but no, those were all um, that was kind of a coincidence in my professional career. But it is where I met a lot of the folks that I work with now, for, uh, Zone and CBD, and a lot of the contacts that are relevant to Lemon Haze as well. Um, and, you know, it, it's great to be part of organizations that promote community and healthy lifestyles. And that's one of the reasons why I was so passionate about being part of the Seattle Sports Commission, because it was not just professional sports, but it's sports going all the way down to getting youth involved, getting communities involved. How do you build positive community no around important. things that make people healthy? And there's so much in common that that has with uh, the cannabis community. Absolutely. And um, yeah, tell us about Lemon Haze. I find it very interesting. Uh, Lemon Haze provides first class events for businesses in the cannabis industry. Um, and you have several different kinds of events. Can you tell us a little more about the mission of Lemon Haze? And maybe we could go one by one about the events you guys do? Sure, sure. So our mission is really to help the cannabis industry grow and by providing connections that haven't been made available uh, to the cannabis industry through, you know, normal, normal, means. normal means. Yeah. Right. So, so instead of, you know, trade shows are great and they help people get a sense of um, the larger picture of what's out there. We throw very small boutique 
focused events that take that trade show and really boil it down to the people who are there are the people who need to meet each other to grow their businesses in the industry. So for example, our virtual upfronts, we connect, um, we connect brands and buyers in an online kind of speed dating format where we get you know a whole bunch of, of retailers to log on and a whole bunch of brands buy into it. And we set up meetings one after another at a 15 minute clip where they all get to meet each other. So there's no, you know, kind of back and forth. When are we going to talk? The brands driving around to different retailers or trying to get in touch with the buyers. We put them all in one virtual spot where from the comfort of their own store or their own production facility, they can meet. And the outcomes of those, we see lots more business going on than leaving everybody on their own to try and connect and get those products in retailers and then in consumers' hands. That's so necessary. And especially with the ongoing COVID stuff. I mean, this is so valuable. It's direct. It's effective. Um, I think very necessary. And I'm sure so many good business partnerships happen out of that. And you guys also have bud tender parties. We do. Our bud tenders first events are... um, uh, kind of the bread and butter of who Lemon Haze is. It's it's where we started throwing events and it's for the most important people in the cannabis industry really are the bud tenders. Um, and making them the VIPs at these events, it really is recognizing where, where the most important decision-making happens in cannabis. And it's at the counter where the consumer is making that purchase. So we throw these parties where um, we, hundreds of bud tenders show up Um, because we're connected to them and we have ways to get to them in every region uh, that we're in in the country. And they show up at these great parties. There's food and there's drink. And then all of the brands that we have in our network come and set up uh, booths where there's information and there's engagement and fun things for them to do. And uh, through our surveys, we understand that bud tenders are over 70% more likely to recommend a product that oh, yeah. they were educated about at one of these events than they are to recommend something else at the counter with a consumer. Now, what is your vetting process? Like if, if, if a listener is part of a company and is like, oh, I want to be there. Can people just uh, go to your website and apply or contact you? H- how does this process work? Oh, sure. So for bud tenders, um, we actually validate employment at a retailer. So we guarantee to all the brands who come, who buy sponsorship packages there, that all of the bud tenders that they meet are current active bud tenders. And so we just have a confirmation process on the back end. So if you want, if you're a bud tender and you want to RSVP for one of those events on our site, you go in through the process, you submit your credentials, you get approved, and then you get a ticket. It's free for all bud tenders. Um, that is an amazing service. Yep. Yep. And for brands, um, you know, you you need to have good products and be relevant in that market. And we love to help brands that are just starting out. We love to connect with uh, women and people of color owned brands. And we love to connect with the brands out there who are also well established and well loved. Um, all of those things are really relevant to the consumer, and the bud tenders really love to connect with with all of them. So anybody who's out there who is putting product in uh, their local cannabis retailers really should be at one of these bud tender parties to connect with bud tenders, and they really get to talk to, uh, depending on the size of the event, two to five hundred bud tenders in one evening. Wow, that's huge. Yeah, that's really big. Yeah. Um, and, and and Chase, more than anything, every one of these events that we throw also is really fun. Everybody has <laughs> an amazing time. I mean, if not just for the business aspect of it, but but people come back because it's just an amazing time to be had. I mean, it's something that I think is really essential to the industry that we all have fun doing what it is that we do. And so, you know, there's food, there's music, there's, uh, there's consumption and really uh, networking with the people who care about things you do. And it's always an amazing crowd. And the bud tenders, I have to say, are the most fun people to throw a party for. (laughs) I believe that. And do you, do you know when the next one is? Is there something Um, like that? Actually, yep. The next bud tender party is tomorrow night in Spokane, Washington. (laughs) 
Okay. Yep. So <laughs> on February 4th and then on February 6th, there's a bud tender party in, um, in Seattle, Washington. And then in two weeks, uh, starting on February 16th, there are bud tender parties in um, Oakland, California and San Diego, California. And I would say check the website for dates because we're adding more all the time and we're going to be all over the country this year. Um, can you let our listeners know the website to go to to check the schedule? Oh, sure. It's lemonhaze.com. So lemon like the fruit, haze, H-A-Z-E dot com. And what is the story behind the name? Is there a story behind the name? Um, there's really not that much of a story. It's the name of a strain that uh, everyone in the company was a fan of. And um, we love to lean into the lemon part of it. It's kind of, it's a little kitschy and fun and it appears at every one of our events. And that's it, it's connected to the industry and it's, it, it kind of showcases that fun, quirky feeling that we have at all of our events. The fact you found a strain that everyone agreed upon, <laughs> that right? itself is a feat, yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> And I, I know you guys had your first, you guys do executive golf classics. You had your first one in October. How did that go? Yeah, actually, we ran a series of them in 2021. And we were pleased and amazed at the response to them. So um, our founder, Brian Yager, is and always has been an avid golfer. And he's also really astute at listening to what this market needs and responding to it. So in the middle of the pandemic, there wasn't much that we could do in terms of events in person. And something that he was doing to stay connected to the cannabis network was he would go golfing with people because it's outdoors, you can stay safely socially distanced. And more and more executives were contacting him saying, hey, I, I wanna golf with you, I wanna talk you too. It was a place to network. It was a place to come together with, with other people. People were starting to request other people to golf with, with him. And then sponsors were like, Hey, how much can I pay to get in and, and buy you guys a round of golf or buy you guys a, a round of drinks? And, and all of a sudden this turned into an event. Hey, let's invite these executives who want to be part of this. And then sponsors can come in and network with them. And so we, we big, had our how, first, how, oh, sorry, how big are these groups? Um, so for a whole tournament at this point, we have between 120 and 140 golfers. And those are all, um, uh, those are, those are mostly made up of brand executives, both um, C-suite executives, VPs, and directors from cannabis, cannabis brands and some ancillaries as well. Do you feel comfortable mentioning some of the brands that have participated? Oh, sure. I mean, really, um, all, I, I would say all the big national names you could think of. We've had people from uh, Cookies and uh, um, uh, Cresco Labs, GTI, Wild, um, uh, Cura Leaf. And then as we go regionally, we also are able to include, and it's most important to us, to include the local brands, um, yeah. brands that are up and coming, brands that need to be connected, and also some brands that are, that are already established regionally. So we like to have a good mix of the MSOs, the big national brands, and what's happening regionally, because we really honor that as we go into a city or a region with these events. And then it's really valuable for all these ancillary sponsors to come in and meet these people um, there, you know, it's a way to uh, it's a way to get into the cannabis business for anybody who's either starting a company and is new and needs to connect where where do I connect with the people I need to talk to come to our event and you'll you'll see a concentrated audience of those executives who are the decision makers that you need to connect with. And we're seeing more and more mainstream companies who know that a valuable part of their business is going to be in cannabis and they're yes. starting to come to these events, pay to be sponsors at these events to connect with these executives, to open up 
that part of their business. Um, healthcare companies, accounting companies, legal companies, architectural companies, who have all been part of the mainstream, who are now seeing cannabis, now seeing the value in being part of the cannabis industry, which is something that we are really pushing um, to, uh, you know, to, to mainstream the entire industry as we know it absolutely deserves to be. It's slowly getting there. Um, actually, we're at the launching point now where everyone's kind of all in based on, you know, cannabis is money at this point and the predictions of what's going to be coming in. And it does impact almost every industry. For these events, do you have certain cities you guys always hit or are you open to new cities? How does that work? So we are expanding our map around the country every year that we do this. Last year was the first year in golf tournaments and we we hit the we tried to hit all of the major metro areas right now where um, cannabis is uh, legalized and becoming a big business. We've expanded the map this year and we're already talking about our 2023 season and expanding the map even further. So we're really excited to see the business itself itself expanding and then bringing our events out there to help connect um, all the pieces of that business to help it grow everywhere. Is there any um, thoughts of going global? Um, we've, we've talked about it. We want to make sure that, um, we're, we're taking care of everyone who's in our network. Um, we don't want to grow too fast, but, um, we, we will be expanding quite a bit as we're able to. And I also want to mention, um, you guys also do cannabis conventions. Are those also listed on your website or? So we have done uh, cannabis conventions in the past. We've done pretty big conventions and there, you know, there, there are other conventions that are out there, but really where we're focused right now are these boutique smaller events where um, the people who need to meet each other are the people at the event. And you're not guessing if somebody's walking by your booth, if they're the decision maker at a company or if you need to talk to them. We're, we're focused on putting together these small events that if you show up, the, the target audience that you're looking for is who we're putting in front of you. Such a valuable, um, important, you're, you're building relationships that need to happen. It's all about relationships. And Lemon Hayes is really doing a great job at doing the networking, building these relationships for people. As a woman in the industry, do you have any advice for women in the industry? Um, sure. You know, it's it's really unique to to be in a leadership position like this because I, I've also I've been in technology, I've been in um uh, consumer package goods, and I've been in consulting. And, um, you know, in, in every industry, you don't find an overwhelming number of women in leadership positions. And we have the same challenges here in cannabis, I would say, but it really does feel like the door is a little bit more open in cannabis than it is in other industries. And, and Chase, it's something that we also pay close attention to. So we've gotten a lot of feedback about our golf tournaments, for example, that more, you know, people have the perception that more men golf than, than women do. And really uh, what we found is that there are more male executives out there who were able to invite to these golf tournaments than, than women executives that we're finding. So what we've done is we have purposefully um, created a network where we're finding the women executives and we're finding the people of color executives and um, promoting these companies that they're part of to get them into our events to create that diversity and to create a better leadership path in the cannabis industry. It's something that we understand is really important and we know it resonates all the way through the industry to the bud tenders and to the consumers. It creates a better experience all around. So, um, you know, I'm particularly sensitive to that being a woman in leadership in cannabis. And um, something that we wanna do is we wanna make sure that that door is wide open. For Fantastic all that you guys are taking the time to make sure that's gonna, that's happening. Absolutely. It's, it's really important to us. And we know that it's, it's important in the, the ultimate success of the industry. Absolutely. Well, Penny, I can't believe this. Our time is out. 
I want to really thank you for being here. If you missed any of this great interview with Penny Cook, you can go to w420radionetwork.com and click on the archive section to listen to this and other great interviews. And we'll be right back. America's newest and fastest growing cannabis focused radio network is expanding across the country and looking to add to our sales and marketing team. America's Cannabis Conversation offers listeners insight and information on the exploding world of cannabis. It also gives advertisers the opportunity to reach a hyper-targeted audience, literally neighborhood by neighborhood, in markets all across the country. We're looking for a few motivated individuals that want to essentially run their own local business. To learn more about this exciting opportunity or to apply, visit americascannabisconversation.com. Thank you for taking part in America's Cannabis Conversation. To hear this show in its entirety or to hear any of our archive shows, log on to americascannabisconversation.com and tune in for the next installment of America's Cannabis Conversation. W420radionetwork.com